All right. Okay. All right, good afternoon. Um, thanks to Roger, who has uh, all kinds of local business, and Tom and others to invite me here. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you. I've already had many uh, short discussions and made um, um, set up dates to look at uh, all kinds of projects, so I guess my agenda is already full almost, so <laughs> but uh, we'll always squeeze out more. It's, I'm, I'm really interested to talk with as many of you as possible about your particular interests. and. Yeah, I'm here, I'm a free resource, so if you think I can help, um, try me. Um, I will say that I am a little, you know, we, uh, this, this nerd term uh, has fallen, but uh, I, yeah, I'm a bit like that. Um, I like uh, long run solutions. I like to work on solutions that um, yeah, run and, and fix the, you know, something quickly. Yeah, let's make something bigger, let's step back. and do something that will work for a longer time, uh, that's sometimes really at my detriment. It's not something I necessarily recommend to PhD students to do at all. You just want to get done. Um, but sometimes there's this opportunity to do it uh, in certain fields yourself or you know, look at people who might be willing to do that for you. Um, I'm going to talk about raster data, or I think the talk was environmental data, uh, modeling environmental data with R. Um, but Basically, I'm going to talk about raster data because that's what I've worked most on in my work, but also um, particularly in the context of R. So here's, here's the outline. Uh, Tom suggested I first talk a bit about myself a bit so that you know what I actually do. Um, and then I will use that to get into, you know, why do I use R for spatial data? How did I get to that? Um, then I'll give some um, more technical overview of how you can manage raster data uh, within R. And then I'm going to heroically try a live demonstration. Um, they, they always fail, but, but not today. Um, and that live demonstration will be pretty much covering a large part of what the workshop that I lead tomorrow is about. Uh, maybe Tom should, if he has some time, also spend five minutes or a couple minutes at some point about your workshop, because I got this question, you know, which one do I take? Um, <laughs> Not so much a competition, but you know, I, I was trying to get people towards you so I would have an easier day. Um, but maybe it would be nice if people could take a, a more informed uh, decision. So maybe at some point you can also at least you know, give a little spiel. Maybe at the end of the day we will summarize the day and then we will say tomorrow, okay, who's going where and, and yeah. And then I can, and I can end, if there's time, with more sort of more advanced roster stuff, sort of you know, things I'm thinking about and, and, and harder things to do. Uh, the challenge, of course, with a group like this is that you, know, you go from beginners to people who have really used these kind of things for many years. You know, and hopefully I can, I can uh, say something interesting for, uh, for many. So what do I do? Um, well, very hot stuff, I suppose. Um, my background is uh, in agriculture. I studied... Uh, crop science in Wageningen in the Netherlands. Um, and I've always used, you know, well, in my work, I've, I've always been using, doing some kind of modeling, ecological modeling of some sorts, first of crops, then of all kinds of other species. And I've also, also almost everything I do is in the context of some spatial pattern, or, you know, spatial analysis of some sort. Um, but I've done many different things, and, and I'll, just, I'll just show some, some very some slides, basically some maps, so have some, that you get some notion of the kinds of things um, that I work on, just maybe as, as, as a way to, to you know, get a con uh, conversation going. Um, here's a recent paper looking at the origin of peppers. So I'm interested in where crops come from. I'm, I'm generally interested in biodiversity, and particularly in um, economically useful biodiversity in, this, in the context of agriculture, both in wild species that, are, that can be used in agriculture, but also in, in current patterns in, in uh, cropping and how you can use all kinds of aspects of biodiversity to make agriculture um, more um, attractive from many uh, perspectives. But this, this was just a study to look at uh, where the chili peppers come from, and we looked at archaeological data, ecological modeling, you know, in the mid in mid Holocene, where, where would you think these, these uh, species could have grown? There was some genetic data. And there's paleolinguistic data that, you know, I won't go into any of the details um, about how this all works. You can look it up uh, if you type my name in Pepper in, the, in Google. Um, 
but, but there's a typical example of what I'm interested in, to bring together different types of data um, around a single question in a spatial context. One of the things I was talking about it over lunch that I really like about spatial data, they are one really nice way to uh, be cross-disciplinary. It's one very nice way to integrate different data sources around a single question. We often uh, work in very disparate disciplines, um, isolated uh, literatures, different methods around similar problems. Um, spatial analysis is really a very nice way to integrate that. And so this, this is one example of, of, of taking data out of different um, domains to bring it together and to then have some, some idea about why, where this uh, uh, particular crop was first uh, domesticated and used. Um, another example um, work that I did with Jakob von Etten, who's the um, author of the G-Distance package, some of, you, some of you may know. Um, a pretty nifty package that deals with um, dispersal. Uh, think of uh, cost distance and more advanced similar um, measures of how, how do plants go over the landscape. So this was analysis to understand how both out of archaeobotanical data and genetic data, um, how maize out of central Mexico um, expanded throughout the Americas. And you know, the reasons for doing that actually were quite applied, but I won't go into that. Uh, it's a difficult question, so here there's some alternative paths that depending on some parameters that, you know, it, it, we'd be not quite sure whether, you know, it got out of, of, of Mexico and it went to Yucatan, to Cuba, or rather, um, whether it went around uh, all the way to Florida and jumped over, um, but those are the kind of questions we were, we were looking at. Um, or something else here, this, then that's, that's historical, this is current patterns of diversity um, in maize, so the richness patterns. Um, can make different different groups by by clustering, um, and then finally, I think this is the last one I have uh, about sort of you know my general work. This is this is a projection of climate change effects on uh, uh, wine growing regions in the world, and sort of talking about you know where uh, good wine uh, might go away and where you might want to buy land to you know be the next big wine millionaire. Uh, and particularly also where we thought there might be issues like in, in, in the northwestern United States where uh, the value of wine might drive a lot of, um, you might, might create a lot of new wineries in areas that are currently um, important wildlife corridors. So, so also looking at land use uh, conflicts. Um, so a lot of that work, I mean, this, is, this is the type of work, work um, um, or the type of things I do. And, and you know, I, I understand this is a very brief uh, overview, but maybe you know, it gives you some of the taste of what I'm interested in. Um, as, I, as I show with that, that cartoon, um, is that to, to you know, it, it tends to take me a lot of time to do these things. Because you know, I, when I look at, at these, some of these questions, I say, well, okay, I need to map um, A, B, C, or D, or like you know, uh, the, the example Roger gave some health data, I often work at a global scale, um, and so, we need to, I, so I then want administrative boundaries, and I want census data, and uh, in, in, uh, no matter what you do, you, you at least say, well, the, the, the data are poor, they're hard to get to, you have to download them for every, every single country, and so I do a lot of projects where I try to uh, uh, create large databases, and this is one example, the GEDM database, uh, by, by compiling uh, secondary data and make it easier to access it and more, more comparable, so you sort of know what you get for different countries. Um, this, this, this particular one is very difficult because it's very hard to keep it up to date. Um, there will be a new version coming out this summer. Um, and so it's clearly not a very good model. Um, you know, the ideal model for, for compiling these kind of data, of course, is a network where every country has a representative and something like, some system like that. Um, I'm not too good in organizing that kind of thing. I'm more like a you know, person who just want to work, wants to work by themselves, I suppose. Uh, but maybe one of you can, uh, can become such a person. Um, here, here's an example of why I wanted, the, wanted, I wanted these GEDM data. Not for, you know, so, so people may know me for this kind of work, which I don't really care about too much, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's hard work, it's important. But what I cared about was you know, I wanted to map um, income uh, in different countries, and I needed these boundaries to get the data. Another example is the WorldClim database. Um, so get high-resolution you know, high uh, climate data, 
uh, to do the type of modeling that we'll talk about and we'll use tomorrow in the in the workshop. So that was a, a big job. And again, a new version will be coming out this summer, which is much improved, has some uncertainty um, and some other things. Um, and another, just a last example before I get into the R things. Um, uh, software Diva GIS is something I worked on for years to to um, uh, do some of these things before um, um, QGIS existed and before. Um, R was um, uh, as useful as it is now. It's, it's, still, it's still available. Uh, people still use it a lot for to, to, to my chagrin, anyway. I, I wish they wouldn't, um, because I feel it's so outdated, but it's, it's there. Um, and what can I say? OK, so that was any questions about this part? <laughs> I hope not too detailed. Questions? No? OK, that's part one. I, I want to make sure that we do some different little parts. And it's a long, I have a, an hour and a half, so I know how hard it can be to listen to somebody for an hour and a half. But I have a little video halfway, which is kind of funny. So um, maybe that will help. But uh, do, do, do feel free to um, shout at me and you know, questions, or insults, or whatever. Just, just make, keep things a bit alive. So R for spatial data. So, so a couple of years ago, I, I, yeah, I, I got into that. Um, Long story short, um, at that point, people said, and, and a lot of this has been talked about already this morning, so I can go over it very quickly, but people would say, yeah, why don't we have GIS for that? Um, and, and in a way, you know, that's exactly what, what, what Tom was saying, but why are you doing R? Don't we have GIS for that? And what's that, what's that, what's that um, balance? And you'll see that every one of us, you know, whether it's Tom or Roger or me and Retz or whoever will be speaking here, has, has somewhat of a different view on, on what that balance is. So Tom was saying, well, it's nice to, to sort of bring these communities together. I'm much more interested in just doing everything in R. Um, I think that, that, that's really what I want to do. But that's not because it's right. That, that's, you know, that's who I am. Um, but, but the reasons, you know, the, I, will, I will say two, two or three things about this. I mean, reputability has, be, has, been, has been mentioned by Roger. I was, I was the head of a lab in the Philippines, and I would... Um, People would come to me with results. You know, they would work on the project and you know, show me here's a result, and you look at it. Well, you know, the world map is upside down, or just, you know, all, all kinds of things were wrong with it. And you ask, well, what did you do? Well, I had this. You know, worked in ArcGIS for two days, and I clicked all these buttons, and here it is. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, so it's wrong. So I'll try again. You know, try again. And now, okay, so and, and eventually get it right, probably. Now somebody else comes into the lab. Say, oh, I'd like to apply the same procedure. How do you do it? Now, there's, there's no formal way to transfer that, to maintain, to document what you've done. So that, that documentation, that, that ability to inspect what was actually done, uh, tremendously important. Um, for me, the, the, though, the, the real reason why I started um, with R was that I wanted to use some, some algorithms, some, some, some new machine learning algorithms like Random Forest that are available in R, but not in, say, ArcGIS. Like most analytical things are not available at RGS or at Grass. It's a bit absurd. <laughs> that struck me as a bit over the top. So Mark is saying, well, I can make a histogram in, in Grass. Sure, in histogram, but you know. Um, general data exploration modeling methods are not available in GIS. And I wanted to do that. And I got really sick of exporting data, importing it, exporting it, importing it. And every time you make a mistake, every time you want to do a little bit different, you, know, you have to go to that manual step time and again. Of course, you can script in all kinds of different ways. But that was really what, what, what drove me. Um, and I think it's particularly important for this audience. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, of different settings in which you can work with spatial data. Um, Sometimes it's really much more about engineering and, 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 um, and speed and, and things like that. Uh, but if you're, if you're a, a scientist or an inspiring scientist as a PhD student, you know, creativity and innovation, that's, that's, that's where you will really want to be. And that's where tools like R, uh, which have downsides, um, um, are, are really um, at the top. But all those things. It's difficult, uh, you know, the help files, you know, you sometimes read like, oh, this, this fantastic uh, um, help files. You know, I, I find it amazing how poorly the documentation is done often. And, you know, you can't complain. You say, well, everybody's a volunteer. And that's true, you know, but you can't, you know, so that you have no basis of, you know, you didn't pay any money for it, right? So, but, but, it's, but it's very strong, you know, by geeks for geeks uh, sense, particularly by statistical geeks for, you know, so that we'll never explain the littlest thing about what, what is this statistics thing about. It's like, well, there's a book. You, you, you read it up. Uh, you, you find out. Um, or, or, you know, do your homework. 
So that, that can be really um, uh, difficult. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I try to be a little bit different but, uh, and try to go a little bit further with that in the documentation I write, but it's, 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 always, it's always difficult. Um, so, so, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that are missing. And it's not perfect, not complete, but it's, um, it's the best I know that in my, in the kind of, for the kinds of things I want to do. So I'm going to talk about um, raster data. Um, and I understand that not everybody um, here has a, a lot of background in spatial data. Many do. But just to make sure that we understand the different concepts. So typically in spatial data, we talk about vector data or raster data or grid data. Raster and grid are synonymous. synonymous. Um, vector data are used to represent points, lines, and polygons, or if you like, well-defined objects. A country, you, you, you sort of you know where that country begins and where it ends, more or less, or the location of a weather station, a road, well-defined spatial objects, at least at some scale. And so they're represented by x, y coordinates as points, or then you can say, well, these points are actually connected into a line. I mean, this is not mathematically a line, so it'd be a, within GIS, we call that just a, um, you know, this polyline, a line. They can be combined, this can be just the roads in California, uh, or they can be separate objects. And then you can say, well, you can then combine, combine again, or, or you know, uh, complete again from the begin point to the end point, and now you have polygons. So, that, so this is how we think about well-defined spatial objects, or typically how they are represented. There's other data, though, that doesn't go well in this, um, this type of, of, of concept. So any, any suggestion where we just say that what well, doesn't fit the vector model? What, what is not a well-defined spatial object? The atmosphere, yeah. yeah. What about the atmosphere? Clouds. clouds. Well, clouds could be. Yeah, clouds are a tricky one. I like a better one. <laughs> I'll come back to clouds. Anyone? Precipitation. Precipitation. And why is that not well defined? It has no it, yeah, it's everywhere, right? There, well, I mean, there's amount, an amount is everywhere. Or elevation. You know, you're here and you're here, and there's always. You could say, well, um, there are steps. And you, and you can, of course, do elevation with, with polygons, right? Contours in the map, you can think of them as polygons. But typically, it's continuous. So cloud, yeah, you could think of cloud cover as a continuous or non There's always, you could also think of a cloud as, a, as a, well, at one point in time, here is that polygon. So it depends a bit on, on, the, on the application. And very often, that's actually the case. I mean, it's not really one way or another. It just sort of depends on our perspective, what we want to do with the data. But there's at least this notion of co more continuous data that then are sampled on a raster of a certain dimensions and resolution um, because we, you know, we, we, it's hard to uh, actually capture a continuous field without discretizing it a bit in a raster. So this is what a raster looks like. Um, Roger defined it in a way that I don't like it um, because he said you need to know the center point and, and then the resolution. I think that's the wrong way to do it because that leads to, to errors for large rosters. What you want to know is the extent. Where does it begin? Where does it end? And then how many rows and columns do you have? It's the same thing, except that you don't have a rounding error. And then you have cells, and typically the way to count them is, is you have rows and columns. And the way I count them anyway is cell 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 until... 30 in this case. So that's a very con the basic concept of a raster. Right? It's a very simple um, um, structure. And it's important to realize that to know something about cell 24, you don't need to store the coordinates of that cell. And Roger also mentioned that, because it's all implicit. Given that you know the coordinates of the extremes and what row and column it is, it's very easy to um, figure out where that is. And that makes it efficient, much more efficient than representing all of this by polygons, which, of course, you could do. All right, so here's an example of, of, of raster data. Uh, a satellite image, this is a MODIS image of, of uh, Central California, where I live, in Northern California, the Bay Area, Lake Tahoe. Um, you get two of these or one of these per day. So raster data is very common through remote sensing. And so what does the raster package do? And, and, and so what I did, you know, I, 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 as I told you a bit why I went to, into R, and of course I found the SP package. And rather than saying, oh, it, you know, here's this great classes and use that, I said, no, I'm going to, do, I'm going to develop my own package, um, for better or worse. 
that's always, that's always a tricky thing to decide, right? Because, because um, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot to be said for keeping things together. But I had my reasons, and, and, and partly, you know, partly out of misunderstanding uh, what the SP actually could do, and partly uh, maybe for good reasons as well. Um, but one of the important ones was what was different, that I didn't want to have any file size restrictions. So a lot of these raster files, unlike uh, vector files generally, uh, are, are, can be very large. You might have hundreds and hundreds of satellite images that you cannot easily now load, in, load into memory to, um, uh, to analyze which was something that was assumed um, you would have to do with the SP package. So that was one important reason um, to develop it. The other reason, which, which could have been done differently, is that, yeah, you don't ask if you can do it with R, ask how you can do it. Well, yeah, uh, and how much time it might take you. So th this, is this, this, is pass, this is the pass me the salt thing. You could do all these things that you can, you know, all these all kind of raster operations with existing classes, but the, me the methods or the functions to do that weren't there. So you could write them yourself. Um, but that can be difficult and it takes a lot of time. You make mistakes, so there's a lot of efficiency that could be gained by writing a package that already has these functions. So that was um, um, at least as important. So let's, let's look a bit at what, what it then looks like uh, before I start into the, sort of the live demo. And so um, load the raster package through the library command, um, and then you can create an object in two different ways. You can say raster parentheses, always use parentheses for, you know, with a function to execute it. No arguments, you get some a default. You can look at which is a global, that is a longitude one degree grid, uh, or with a file name of a, a raster data set, and you get here at object X, if you print it, it doesn't show you the data, it just shows, show, show you, shows you some uh, properties, metadata if you like. Um, how many rows and columns do I have? What is the spatial extent? What's, what's the CRS that, that um, uh, Roger talked about as well? And so now you have this object and we can, we can use that um, in all kinds of computations. You can look at the structure but this is something that I would hope you don't need to do, unless you're really just curious. The idea is that you don't really know, need to know what's inside of it. It's just there, it'll be taken care of, uh, you know, the, the, the functions know about it, you don't have to really know about it. Until you reach a point where you say, no, I really need to do something else, I need to write my own functions, maybe at that point. But even then, I don't think you would need it. Because every time you need information that is inside of these classes, there should be functions that pull out the information and that should be the safest way to uh, deal with that. The internal workings of these, of these classes can change um, without notice, but the, there will always be uh, functions to uh, extract the information you need. Another important thing, of course, and I already alluded to that, is that that, you know, that was just one layer for this volcano data set that comes with R. Um, Space-time, that, you know, that's, that's sort of the hot, hot word, it seems, that, uh, for this meeting and maybe over the past you know, two or three years um, in R and generally is that, that um, you know, it was, it was a big deal uh, long, uh, quite a, a couple of years ago to have spatial data. Uh, and there was also time series analysis. Only now, over the past, you know, decade or so, we, you, you are starting to get, you know, sp spatial, you know, large spatial temporal data sets. So this is one example of, of rainfall from the, the TRIM satellite, um, daily rainfall data uh, for one year. And of course, it exists for ma many more than one year. So we need also um, w have ways to represent that running on a raster layer ob object that I uh, showed you before, that we have the raster stack and raster brick that, that you can use to point to multiple, single, multiple files or a single file with multiple layers in it. So these are the, the main objects um, to capture uh, raster data. Then there's a set of basic functions that uh, some of these you, you, know, you don't typically use, they're more used if you write functions like, well, how many cells does the object have? Uh, given you know, f what are the x, y coordinates from object x for cell 10. Um, give me the values of, for a particular row. Or, well, this is actually a common one, write the raster object to file if you create a new one. So these, these are what I call basic functions, and there's many, many of those that, that are used to create higher level functions. Um, you can do raster algebra. Create, here I created just an empty raster, 10 columns, 10 rows. I assign values from one to number of cells, R, so I have 10 cells, uh, 10 rows, 10 columns, so 10 times 10 is 100 cells. So I have now a raster R with values one to 100. 
And I can do algebraic expressions, like give me the square root of that or you know, anything algebraic. Um, sum to two times two, and now make a stack, make a raster stack of that. Now I've S with three layers, and I can comp multiply S with R. So I have an, a three layer raster stack, one existing raster, I can multiply them. And in the typical R fashion, you know, it's, how does it work? You have three layers, you multiply with one layer, the shortest one gets recycled. So each layer in S gets multiplied with R. So what you end up is R times R, Q times R, and X times R. Half of you can't follow this, I'm sure. Who can follow? <laughs> about, about half. Which is, which is okay. Um, tomorrow we'll, we'll work on this and, you, and you'll see how it works. I mean, it, it's, it's hard, hard to... Um, and, and I, I think, you know, the, I loved your, what, what, say it again, what was your, uh, your uh, was it Latin you say, uh, learning is about repetition? I very much believe in that, so, so it, it doesn't matter if it's summed over your head the first time, but try to get a sense of what I'm talking about and um, it will become clear. But actually, I mean, your package allows you to remove the complexity of having a spatial object and then just do arithmetics. I mean, so that's what, you know, an SP wouldn't be able to do so easily. It 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 takes it takes a l it, it's a little bit easier I would yeah. say yeah. Yeah, but but if, like in the case when you have a stack and it's not the same grid, see that's where it gets complicated, right? We don't have the same uh, cell sizes and things yes. like that. Yes. yes. Can you still do the raster computing the way you do it? Okay, well that's a good that's a good question and sort of that's all. Um, um, it also leads to these, these uh, functions. So now I get to a, a list of, of sort of higher level functions. So merge, you know, put different rosters together, crop, cut out a, a one, uh, one part, a project a raster actually called, change the CRS, aggregate, make bigger, bigger cells. Um, and so now to get to, get to uh, that question, um, no, you cannot. You cannot say, okay, I have a raster with small cells and big cells and I want to multiply them um, because everything has to align. And so um, ArcGIS will do it for you anyway. ArcGIS doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have any problem with it at all. Um, the first GS uh, software that I used intensively, I, I guess I, I, I learned ArcInfo first, but then what I really used was Idrisi. Anyone use Idrisi here? It's, it's such a pity. It's so nice. Um, it's one of these packages that, that programs really missed the boat by not going open source, I think. But, um, but if you know it, you'll, you'll see I'm very much influenced by it. it, it a roster package is very similar in sort of what it does and how it does it. And, and, and so th this, this notion of um, having these um, pens, yeah, where are they? Here. Let's see if I can do this. Yay. So say I had a roster here, and now I can do a... Oh, no. I thought that could be a different color. From the oh, there. <laughs> when I... Oh, no, that's red. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So uh, This is how it goes away. I don't know. Okay, so I have a red one. I won't do red and green. I, every, you know, when Roger was talking, so who cannot distinguish red and green? Nobody, nobody's honest. <laughs> ten percent of ten percent of male cannot distinguish very well red and green. So that I, I, every time he saw like Roger said about this, this British map, so well, but of course it's not so good. I, was gonna, I thought he was going to say because you cannot put red and green on a single map. But he never, he never said it. Um, I'm sure he knows, but uh, don't use red and green on a single map um, unless you don't care about men or ten percent of the men, which is <laughs> reasonable. Um, so yeah, so so how do you add, add up? How do you add these things up, right? So I have the, the red one and the black one, and we want to sum them, the values, right? I have values for, all the, for these four cells, and how do you add them up? Um, yeah, interestingly, as I said, ArcGIS will do it. They will, they will give you something. How do you do it? I have no idea. I'm sure you could reverse engineer it and try many things, um, but that's why I don't like it. I, would like to, I want to know what, 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 what to do. And so in this case, what you would need to do, you have to choose. Well, do I like, well, one option is to like the black one or, and, and 
transfer the red cells to a raster like the black one, or vice versa, or even take yet another one and transfer everything to that third one. And so you can, of course, estimate. Um, so if you, if you want to estimate the red values, say this was um, one and two and three and four, you can estimate what the value here should be. Well, probably one, because it's all inside of that red square or rectangle. For this one, well, it's half one, half two, so that's probably going to be 0.5 or 1.5. Let's so this one is, is trickier. Well, it's a quarter of each, right? So two and a half, and so forth. So, so you can estimate that, and that's simply not with a function like resample. It also shows that so many changing raster data is loss, lossy. You know, you cannot do that and then estimate back what it was originally because you always make these estimates. Maybe in this case you could. Um, but Roger was talking about projecting data, going from one CRS to another, so from geographic, you know, latitude, longitude to UTM. You always want to do that with your vector data and not with the raster data, if at all possible. Keep the raster data as they are because changing projections uh, um, leads to loss. It's also therefore very important, particularly if you work with a raster package, that you think about when you set up your first raster that it's really you know, at the highest resolution you want to work with and, and in the right extent that everything else can sort of follow that same um, um, design. So what I see a lot of people starting with all these different data sets, don't pay attention to that, and end up with all kinds of not quite uh, overlapping uh, data sources and it's hard to put them back to, well, it's easy to put them back together uh, but there's always some loss involved. So, so um, some people would like this to be more automated. So I'm giving a very long answer to this, this question, but I think it's important. They say, well, why don't you just yeah, hocus pocus, make it, make it happen. And I'm very much, and it's, it's ironic because I'm very much the person who always thinks that things should actually just happen. So Roger was more, more the person who said, well, you have to be careful because people have to under understand what they're doing and, and, and don't make it too automatic because people may overlook a lot of things. I tend to be more at the other extreme. No, it should just work. Um, but here's, here's a point where, where also I stop. All right, and then, there, and then there's all kinds of analysis. And, um, and this is really where, where, uh, what I, I started out with, where, why I want to work, um, um, why I'm inter interested in, in, in R particularly is, is for example, is, is predict function. You build a model and you make predictions towards uh, uh, rasters. Or, yeah using R functions and or, um, or external models, any kind of model that, that you can write or that already exists. Oh, and of course you can make nice maps. Um, I'll admit that if, for my publications, I typically go to ArcGIS to make final maps because I re I'm really picky about how I want things and I find it easier to drag things around. QGIS is also pretty good now. Um, Nothing though uh, like R for making quickly a lot of maps or making, you know, this, 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 is, this is a lot of work in RGIS here, it's just one uh, um, command. And so for quick views, uh, for appendices, I think it's great. Uh, final, you know, or fun things. So this is one of the examples of uh, Oscar Perpignan uh, Rastervis uh, uh, package that, that uh, Rosé referred to. Uh, so, you know, you're so I think there's solar radiation in Spain, but you not, only, you not only see the values, you also see a latitude and a longitudinal profile. And you can do all these, all these fancy things that are actually very hard to do in, a, in a GIS, typically. Or something fun like this. Um, here's four lines to make a little map of uh, where we are with the Dismo package. There's a couple of different packages that, that, that deal with these uh, Google APIs. Another one, I'll skip that one. All right. That was my intro to roster, and now I go to my uh, hands-on. Is it, is it till 2.30 I have? Is that what it is? Yep. Yeah, so I better hurry up. Any questions? Who of you has, have worked with roster and f f felt that I wasted your time because you already knew everything? <laughs> so kind to pull your arms back. <laughs> you could all, or, or, yeah, or Maybe I should have asked who hasn't worked with it and nevertheless felt that. Um, and so, okay, so in my example, I uh, thought I, uh, I'll take something local. So when I think of Norway, I think of lemmings. Lemmings are these nice creatures um, that are often used as, um, 
people, you know, people think they make, they make, a, they, they make other people think of uh, humans, you know. Give you a little, uh, this is my little entertainment here. Oh, I need to put the sound in. It's in. Now I just put the sound up. This is not nearly as much fun without the sound. It's, not, it's really dramatic. Uh, let's see. Do you know how to turn it on? Uh, okay, it's the, the, the panel here. Yeah, the right off. Turn myself off. Should I? Yeah, let me try. Oh well, you know, it's not so important. Oh, you can't even see anything anymore. The other one is oh, still there. Okay. The, the hyperlink is on the PowerPoint, and um, you can watch it tonight in your, in your hotel room um, if you're into a drama. There's this night, there's this music. And, uh, so it's all about these, these little creatures. Then, uh, they're, actually, they're actually throwing them in the water here. So that's the other thing about this movie. This is an old uh, documentary where they actually uh, got these lemmings and they throw them in the, in the water to, to shoot the picture. So it's all, it's all staged. Um, which makes it even much more interesting, right? So this was before the time there was a disclaimer at the end of the movie saying no, no animals were, were, uh, were harmed. This is, this is made by Walt Disney, but it's in the 1950s. You know. It's the same, you know, Tom and Jerry, and they all hit each other, so it's, it's fine for them. Okay, so here's these lemmings uh, floating away. So lemmings, for in case, you know, I wasn't sure how cultural uh, lemmings are, if everybody knew what a lemming was, so some people have come from far away. So let's, um, let's now look at lemmings, um, let's do some analysis. And what I'm going to use, I'm not sure what happened to that one, uh, maybe if I take pull this out again. You can put that back. Um, so I'm going to use some of the GBIF data that was, that was referred to uh, um, by Agus this morning. Um, GBIF is, is a wonderfully interesting uh, um, organization project that compiles observations of, of species from many different collections. I forgot the numbers now, but okay, here you have um, 377 million geo-referenced occurrence records. Um, and they've done it over a decade or so. They didn't collect them, yeah, they, just, they just compiled them, and other people have been very busy making it available. And so you see a lot of, you know, of course you see this huge bias that Tom referred to. Apparently there's no species in Siberia. Um, much worse, there seem to be many, many more uh, uh, different uh, uh, species in uh, Western Europe, the United States, than in, say, um, Amazonia. So there's a lot of bias, you know, where of course you would like to have many more records because there's much more diversity there. But nevertheless, it's an amazing, one of these amazing data sets that, that really have changed the kind of things we can do now um, compared to 10, 20 years ago. So let's see if I can convince you of that. So I have some um, code, and I guess I'm going to just do this. Let's see if that works. There we go. I'm going to make it bigger. View, misc, edit, GUI, size 14. Yeah. Okay, so um, I wasn't sure if I was going to have internet, but this is how you, one way to get uh, data from GBIF using the GBIF function. It takes a little while. Um, this comes from the Dismo package that we'll use tomorrow. Uh, it finds 1,800 records, and it's downloading them. It should be about done. Oh, I do? It's, it's still 3. It's still 3, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And so you have a 5 a.m. also on your, your laptop, so you have to switch yeah. different time zones. So I'm almost waking up. <laughs> so if I'm still a bit sleepy, that's... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that will matter. But uh, anything else you see in my computer, I should hide. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, so we got this data. 
Um, let's have a look what's in there. Uh, it's messy because it's it's if we do the dimensions. So we have these 1,800 records with the 25 columns. Um, let's just look at the head again anyway. It just fits on. Uh, or well, I think I probably missed the first. Yeah, it starts all the way here. So Lemus Lemus, so that's, I had to look it up, but that's the official name of the Norwegian um, type. There, there are different um, lemmings in different places, but from Europe, Norway, uh, et cetera. Particular locations where they were collected, collected or observed. Typically, these, these, these are animals that were trapped and then cut open, and the skins were taken to a museum and stuck you know, they're in drawers in museums. Um, but it is longitude. So, this one was collected by Edward Haske in 1982. What else can I say about it? Um, what I find interesting, actually, most of these are from the MVZ, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley, where I used to work. So it's nice to see those back up, coming up here. Um, so we have this information about, you know, some basic information about these, these records, who observed them, where they observed them, and we've led to the longitude. So let's, let's, um, let's explore the latitude longitude, and I'm not going to make any spatial class at this point. Let's just say, um, so what I call this G, um, plot G. Um, I probably have, you know, I probably shouldn't type too much, it's going to take too long, so let's just go back here. Um, oh, well, here what I do, actually, I make an SP object. So this is, this is a very interesting um, syntax. I um, should probably also make this bigger. Uh, view, edit. What is that? Oh, did you see that? Where's Zoom? Oh, there. <laughs> Zoom in. Control num. That's too hard. So let's just do it again. View zoom. That's too many buttons to. Uh, control mouse wheel up. Or zoom in. Yeah, anyway, that's a bit better. So this this is very interesting. Uh, SP language. So you say coordinates of G become a function of longitudinal latitude. So it's a, it's a nice. They, they've they've reused sort of the the, the um, syntax to do a. Um, a statistical model. Um, I always find, yep, I use this in, in teaching a lot, and, and this is one step that people get a little bit lost about, like, what, what is this? But this is one of the things, just, just, just accept it. If you have long, you know, a column called long and a column called lat in your data frame, which reads CSV or, or a GBIF function creates, um, this is how you can make a spatial points data frame. It's one of these things that once you know it, it's actually very nice. Um, let's see what I did. Hmm. What did I do? What is this? Oh, the R editor, sorry. It didn't do anything. Okay, let's copy it over. This was referred to earlier today, too. Yeah, you get these errors. Um, and very often, it's, it's just really hard if you're a beginner to read, read errors like this. So who thinks they know what this means? The number of rows and data frame and spatial points don't match. If you listen carefully to Rosane this morning, you might have a clue. He actually did say it. I mean, he said sort of, you know, something about spatial point data frames that might point you. So any idea? Who, who has any idea? Ooh, well, Ed, sir? <laughs> you, have, you have an idea, right? <laughs> That's an idea. Uh, you know, I'm not, yeah, well, I'm trying to make fun of him, but it's the same what happened to me. You know, he, he's, he's to blame in a way. Well, he, you know, he designed most of this, but it's the same for me. If I see error matches coming out of software I've written, it's not always clear what it is. But, um, yeah. Something with spatial pixels? Something with spatial pixels. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, no. no Go ahead. Missing coordinates, that's what it is, yeah, yeah, very, very good. Yeah, so the problem is that that's in a spatial points data frame, you cannot have missing coordinates. So we have this, we have this data frame, and we have low, longitude latitude, at least we saw the first five rows, but they don't all have that. 
And whereas you could make a shape file where you actually have this null coordinates, you'd have the record but not null coordinates with a spatial points data frame that's not allowed. Um, and so, that, so there that fails. Um, and so what we can do, and well, let's first see if that's true. Yeah, if you say, well, how many of these latitudes in G are NA? Well, 99 out of the 1800 or so. So that's not a big concern here. Um, let's remove them and try again. Let's just do all of this. All right, so I remove them. I say, well, G only when it latitude is not NA, those are the ones I want to keep. So this, this is something that becomes true or false. So, I, so you say, is NA latitude? It's either true or false. We don't want to keep the NAs, so we want to keep the ones that are not NA. So everything that's true here should become false and vice versa. And I use that exclamation mark, not. And then I use it as a first index, so all the rows of object G. So G is this thing of this table. The first index is the row, the second is the columns. Gives me all the rows where this is true and I reassign that to G. Now I can do this and then I also assign um, for completeness the, um, the CRS, so the longitude latitude data. And here I'm just guessing it's WGS84. <laughs> um, Again, because I've, I feel at this point, you know, well, this is an example anyway, so I'm not going to be worrying too much about it, but other sources of uncertainty are surely going to be much more important. So let's look at some sources of uncertainty. So we, so, well, where, where is this? Well, okay, let's, 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 um, I can show you where this is. I mean, you, you can probably guess. Um, we got the map tools, world simple, useful, and let's, because everything is black now, the points G color is red. Okay, great, most are in Norway. Well, we had the Norwegian lemming, so that's, that seems, seems good. Now, it's quite a few in, in Central Europe. Um, I won't show that, but it turns out that those are um, um, uh, fossil or, or you know, old records. So those are very, very interesting. And, and I, wasn't, I didn't realize that these were in GBF now. Those are great because I do a lot of climate change work. And often you, you want to project, of, co of course, you know, what's going to be the situation in 2100 or in the future, but the only, these models are not very good, I don't think. Um, but having these historical data and now also uh, climate uh, hindcasts, you can, of course, try, you, know, you can take, uh, say, you know, the climate at, during glaciations and see if that's where you would expect these species to be. Yeah, so the GBF records always with GS84, right? So oh, maybe it's true. Are they, they, they have all been... Um, um, but yeah, to the extent that they knew, or to the extent the providers knew. Okay, I didn't know that. Thank you. Um, but what about this one? Well, first of all, I mean, typically where you you, end, you, 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 you tend to have a whole bunch around here. Why? Yeah, but he, well, he, well, around here? Zero, zero. Zero, zero. Yeah, you always got a lot of just, uh, just south of West Africa somewhere. Yeah, you're very quick, yeah. Well, let's, let's see if that's true. Um, so, and one of the things I like to show uh, today is, is sort of interactive methods, because typically those, they're hard to, you know, a lot of the examples in R you see are, are these written documents, but it's hard to show interactive methods where you have to click on the map. So let's just see, look at that point. So I can do S is select G, and then select this one record, and then we can look at the data frame of that one. Oh, it's actually a whole bunch of them, but they're all from... Mjøsalik, I suppose, in Norway, which is clearly not where it is. Um, and they are at um, latitude 11, longitude 60. Well, it doesn't seem right, but let's see. Um, we now know it should be at Mjøsalik, Norway, Europe. So I can do a geocode. And it says, well, it should really be Mjösa, and it's 1160, so just as you predicted. It's, it's almost exactly at, at what, um, what was it? It was uh, S, lat, S, lon. 
So 11.29 versus 11, 60.39 versus 60. So, so that it's very also pretty easy to automate. If you find outliers, well, the first thing you do, yeah, you, you, you put it there, you say, well, it fits, but then you can also check now automatically with, with Google um, whether that's a reasonable place to put it. Whether, you know, you also would think, well, 11 probably is a rounded version of, of 11.29, but that's anyone's guess, really. It might be. It might also be that now... Um, you end up in the middle of the lake. But then again, we do know that these lemmings sometimes end up in water, whether voluntarily or not. Um, so, okay, so we know that. Um, I'm going to skip that point. Now, you, of course, you want to go back to your, you know, make a spreadsheet and fix that. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so there will be two ways just to get the Norwegian points that seem to be the, the, the ones we want. Again, we could do a um, um, select, and I could just say, you know, well, that's basically... Um, Ah, I got them right. Uh, these are the ones I want. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, some, it can work. Another way would be, which I think I have here. Um, well, this is what I showed here. Uh, let me just finish that line. So, and then, and then you could actually save them to a shapefile, except that it exists. Um, overwrite is true. And it says it abbreviates uh, the field name. So it's an important step to take, though. Of course, the next time you're going to download these data, um, they're going to be different. So it's an important step to when, when even if you use these services, and, and I would predict that over the years to come, more and more of data you will be just using, you know, getting out of over the internet and uh, live into your script. The remaining problem is that they will change. Um, and you, you may want to always use the most up-to-date data, but in another case, of course, you want to make sure that you know, when you publish your paper that you can go back to the exact data you had when you did the analysis rather than some data that maybe has been taken away or added that may change things. Okay, um, let's see what, oh, well, what I really wanted to show. Let's do this first. So another way to, to um, go about it would be to say, well, I'm just going to I'm going to um, select the points that intersect with um, Scandinavia. So I can say I take this world sample, simple, which is these boundaries, spatial polygons, data frame. Take Norway, Sweden, and Finland, um, which is now called SC. And then, and then I add one thing, I do this buffer. I add a buffer by default of one, which in this case will be one degree, and it complains that, well, it's not projected. Um, I use the ArcGeos library, and that only wor really works on projected planar coordinates, not on um, spher spherical coordinates. I don't, I don't care about that right now. It, it works anyway for my intents and purposes. Um, so let's plot that, plot buff. So here's this buffer, one degree around Scandinavia. Um, I can still do points G. These are the ones that are inside. You see those two outside. I can say now let's do select as is uh, intersect um, G with buff. I think this should work. Let's try again. Plot. Oh, let's do points as color is red to distinguish them. And there you have them. So for those of you that like to do GIS and sort of interactively make these things, a lot, a lot, a lot of these things you could do with R. It's not typically what you do because what, what you typically want to have is, is um, well, what you, I'm, more, I'm more likely to do this because this is now a script. And I can run it and I can change the species and, and you can do similar things. Whereas the other one where you, you click uh, requires you know, human intervention and you, can, you always click somewhere else. So that's not, not really an ideal way to go about it. All right. So you, you see, so I'm, I'm going to talk about raster data um, and GIS. Um, not sure what the right amount is, but um, probably in most cases when you do any analysis, 90% of your work is data preparation. Uh, and it's not just raster data, it's also just vector data. And getting, getting your data ready for, um, for action is really um, where the work is and where the important work is. You know, um, it came up a bit this morning, but um, and, and you, know, you talked about biases, um, but understanding what these data really represent. Is it now really true that there's so many more here in the south and in the north, or not? Um, we can talk much more about that, that tomorrow. We may have a whole day about you know, thinking about these methods and, and how you might correct for that, because there are methods to deal with that. Um, but that's really where the work is, so, you know, 
prepare your data and think about it, what it all means. Um, I'm not sure this is really a, let me just show this one, this is kind of fun. Um, I guess we all like these, um, oh, that was, that's nice. So this doesn't work because of the E. Uh. So this is where we are today. Um, not interesting. <laughs> We're in a gray area. I guess it makes some sense. Uh, let's do, um, I'm not sure why I put this in, but I just like to show it, I suppose. Um, okay, here's Bergen. But there was, okay, there's one in, in, little interesting um, point to make. So now let's see where, the, where we are in Bergen. And let's do interpolate is true, higher resolution. Um, XY, it's this geocode the uh, Handel's Hochkölle, or however you pronounce it. So Google says, well, that's what we call a Norwegian School of Economics. Hella volume 30, they release. They're pretty smart up there in Mountain View. And uh, it's in Norway, and they give us longitude and latitude, which is also not, what's also nice, they also give you a bounding box. They say, well, we're not quite sure where it is. So we have this bounding box around it. And, and it's, it's, it's pretty cool to actually start mapping these boxes. Sometimes, you know, if you say um, Mexico, it will give you the center of Mexico, but it will give you a bounding box of the whole country. And whereas in this case, I'm not sure how much it is, but it's obviously pretty, uh, pretty small. Okay, so let's add that point that we have. So it's um, one, two, the third, and the fourth. So X, Y, the third and the fourth column is longitude and latitude. So I should be able to, do, to say, well, points, this, and now uh, C, X, let's make it five, and let's use a nice character for it and make it red. I obviously like red. All right, let's see where it is. Aye. Not here. Por qué? Why? <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> I never have that, that people actually know the answers. Uh, <laughs> sort of, which, which, is, which is disappointing if nobody knows that, but it's good. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a coordinate system. So what might this be? So this, this is pretty clear, like right? This is just longitude. It actually says it's what it is. So what, what is Google Maps in? Strange Mercator. <laughs> yeah, they call it something like Web Mercator, but essentially, let's just call it the Mercator projection. So this, they have this map, if you zoom out, where Greenland is as big as you know, Africa and Asia combined, more or less. Or, um, why do they use it, though? What's the good about the Mercator projection? Straight. Straight lines for navigation, so that people on their boats can uh, go use Google Maps. <laughs> It is a property of the map, it's true. But it, and that's why that was really important when it was invented in the, in the 16th century or so, because it, it's very good for navigation, because straight line is a straight line. Um, but that's not why it's used, that's why Google Maps likes it. Uh. So the problem with these map projections, and you might wonder why do all these different things exist, is that you cannot have your map and eat it, or however you say it. So you always give something up when you make a, a, a sphere flat. You know, think of your orange, you peel it, and then you, you can't make it flat. And so you have to give up either direction or sizes, so relative sizes, so Greenland is very big relative to what it is, or shape. You get distortions. And so Mercator is nice, it, it doesn't distort, so the shapes are conserved. And so if you zoom in, it has a nice shape, but for the whole world it's not very good. And so it's Mercator, and so I have this little helper function, you don't have to go to the official route just for the Mercator because it's a very simple uh, transformation. Um, but it's, a, it's one of these very typical questions we get on Arctic Geo and elsewhere. Like, oh, I have these two data sources and I, put, I do put them on top of each other and they don't show. Projections, projections, projections. They are important. All right. Let's go to the actual uh, raster data and the modeling. Okay, so um, here, this is where we start with raster data. So again, I'm using um, uh, some data from the web. So I'm using these world climate data I, I talked about, so the global uh, climate data. I use some, some variables called bioclimatic variables. Basically what it means is 
rather than using monthly data, you say, you know, the total annual precipitation or the temperature of the coldest month, so that, that places among the world are more comparable. Um, and let's first look at W, what that actually is. It went very quick, by the way, because, um, oh, I want me to zoom, let me escape that. So this would normally take some more time, because if I have to download the data, but because I've already downloaded it before, it's quick. Um, if I change the directory or so, it will be slow. So W is this raster stack. Um, 1,800 rows, 4,000 or so columns, etc. Global extent, except for Antarctica is cut off, long lat, um, and, and here are these variable names, bio1, bio2, it doesn't mean anything to you, but it, it doesn't really matter. So bio1 is average annual temperature, um, degrees Celsius times 10, so minus 27 to 31. Bio 12 is annual rainfall, from, so from zero to almost 10,000 millimeters. Raster stack, 19 layers. So we, we, can, uh, we can plot that. It, yes? So Uh, well, the pre so that was that's a function, that and the only thing that function does is from from lat long to Mercator and back, and it's just a convenience function because of this Google Maps. Okay, so that, that's normally you would use a spatial object and you would use SP transform. Now, as you do that, then you would normally have to specify, oh, it is this projection, or well, it has a projection. This is the projection I want to go to, and then you might use an ESPG code to define that projection. Um, but the ESPG code would be equivalent to a Proj4 string, which, what, which this is. Um, I'm terribly against these ESPG codes. It's funny, it's funny you think that everybody says, oh, you have to use those because they're well defined in the database. Uh, they're entirely opaque because you, you would get like, you know, four, two, three, one or so. I, I really dislike that, although they will, they will expand. So they, they are useful, but I, I, I think at least I always want to see what it is because I, I can more or less read these things, um, whereas these codes I cannot. So I, I don't see, I don't find them too useful. But um, again, you know, we all have, we all are entitled to our own opinions, fortunately. Um, so yeah, we have all these 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 layers, so we can't really see too much what it is. So let's just look at a single one. There's many different ways you could get uh, a single one. Let's call it R. Um, you can do a dollar again, like if it's a data frame by one, or you could do double brackets. So why would I use double brackets rather than single brackets here? It's all very confusing. You have double brackets, single brackets. You see a lot on lists, and you always wonder well, which one do I use and why. And yeah, you just have to figure it out. I mean, it's hard to sort of give the rules, but it's, 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 the reason is that to have both is that, that there are ambiguities sometimes. If I say W1, what do I want? Do I want the first layer, or do I want the first cell for all layers? And so in this case, if I do one, it will give me the values um, of all the cells of the first cell, which are all NA, right? It's up, up near Alaska, Russia there. It's, there's no, this, I only have values for land. Uh, whereas if I do this, I get a raster layer of the first layer. And the same works with lists. Do you want to, if you say one, do you want the first element of the list? Or maybe within that first element, do you want the first, you know, the first list element, do you want the first data point if there are multiple in there? Again, I don't expect most of you to necessarily understand that, but I, I do know that's one source for confusion. So we have this raster layer R. Um, I can plot it. I think. There we go. And uh, let's zoom again. Oh, we can scoot. Let's do like. Let's see if that works. Zoom to Scandinavia like this. Yeah, without clicking. That's nice. Um, so we can zoom in, which is nice. We can also, let's, let's then say um, WC for world claim is um, crop W Scandinavia. So I'm cropping now using Scandinavia as, as the extent. So what in SP is called bounding box, I refer to as the extent. Plot WC1, the first one. Oh, that didn't work. Or what? 
Oh, that's the wrong one I'm looking at. Uh, that must be the one. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So now we have the environmental data for Scandinavia. We have the points. Uh, points S on top of that. Great, so now we have what I, where, now we are where I want to be. I have the roster that I want, more or less. Maybe I, I, let, let's, let's take a little bit more than what I, what I see here. I missed a little part of Norway. Um, probably because that World Simple database isn't, well, I know it's not very precise. So I'm going to crop rather with the extent of this plus two degrees. And it'll be a little bit bigger. Let's see if that's true. All right, done already, already. Okay, now I'm gonna go a little bit quick. I'm gonna run all of this and I'll talk about it as it runs. Oh, <laughs> so much for that. Let's see what's going on here. P, there's no P, because P is called S, I suppose. And there's no library here. Good Good eyes. All right. So the first thing I did, uh, I'll show it here. Let me go this side for once. Um, I say extract from WC, which is this climate data using the points P. So for every point, tell me what is the climate for these 19 variables we have for each point. So now Nana knows something about those points. And I make a data frame out of that and add a new uh, variable, PA, for presence absence, and it's one, because those are the known presence points. And now comes the, the, the trick in the species distribution modeling, that method I'm, I'm showing. Um, I actually forgot to show the introductory slide about it, but um, what, what, what we basically are trying to do is saying, well, these species occur in these places, so we, then we know something about their climate, their environment, that apparently they like, because they're there. Um, now, typically what you then do is say, oh, well, then we compare that to where they're not, because apparently those would be the environments that they don't like. The problem is with, with data sources such as GBIF, we don't really have absence data. We just know where they are, but we don't necessarily know where they are not. Um, again, you know, because we don't really know if, if not observed somewhere means not surveyed or truly not there. And you can go about that in many different ways. Um, and, and this method that I'll also say is what I'm showing here is very similar to uh, image classification in remote sensing, where you have, you, for example, you know this is forest, and here I have some predictors. In this case, it would be climate, but it would be reflection in different bands, you know, different uh, wavelengths, uh, blue, red, uh, what have you. And you say, well, we know this is forest, this is the reflection at these locations, and now predict where else is forest. The difference with that method is typically you would have all possible land covers. So you would know it's either forest, or if it's not forest, it's going to be urban. If it's not urban, it's going to be water, or you, know, you have, have them all. Or at least you would have forest, non-forest. You would not have that. We just have this species is here. And so the typical way to deal with that is to say, well, we're going to compare it with just a random pattern. So if, if it didn't like anything, it would just be all over the place. We're going to see how different, how, how distinct this pattern is from a random expectation. And so that's what I do here. I just get some random points. And in this case, I take as many as I had presences. Typically, you actually take more. Then I extract the values for these random points, make a data frame, say presence absence there is zero, so absent. I combine them. I take a sample, a k-fold sample, I make five, I assign a number one to five randomly to every record to extract 20% for testing, 80% for uh, training the model. Typically, you actually do this five times. Now, every every k-fold will be used once for um, testing uh, and four times for uh, model fitting. I'll talk much more about that tomorrow, this, this whole notion of, of, of cross-validation and why it's so important. And so let's look at um, what I've created. Um, make this bigger, head train. And tail train. 
kibbutz. And so every record here represents one of these points we had, either, either a presence point, or in this case a random point, I'll map them. Climate data for these points, and we know whether present points or absence points when there's a zero here. And just to show that on the map, um, plot WC1 again, and points, let's see what they were called, um, BG. So these are these background points, so just a random sample. And, but the important thing, what you see here, that what the function does, it takes random points in this extent that I specified, but, but it doesn't take anywhere, um, there's no data, so it removes the NAs. Got that. Um, now let's fit a model. Already done that, so well, let's run it again. Doesn't take that long. So I'm using the random forest method here. Who, you, who, know, who has used that? Quite a few. It's, it's, a, it's a method developed by Leo Breiman, um, one of the very popular uh, machine learning algorithms. And again, that's something I can talk at length about tomorrow if people are interested. I think they're very important uh, in this context, having when you have large data sets with many variables that all may contribute a little bit, and you want to avoid overfitting, and you want to have very good prediction. So as Roger was talking about this morning, and, and a lot of the original R software is very much in a sort of inferential statistical framework. Most of my work is it's, it's much more sort of predictive modeling, where you just don't necessarily want to understand everything, although I would like to. But certainly one important objective is make a, make a, a, a strong prediction. And, and Random Forest is a particularly interesting algorithm for that. Other ones, I mean, it, it, sort of, it started mostly with, uh, all with um, um, what they call neural networks. It's one of the first methods like that. We have a complex method. Um, boosted regression trees would be another one. Um, support vector machines, there's a whole, whole set of them. Um, if you look at M, it says uh, what we, what, how good it was. Um, it says, well, it was a call of random forest. Okay, I should explain this. Present absence as a function of dot. Dot meaning here all other variables in the data frame train. So I could have said, I could also have written out present absence as a function of bio one plus bio two plus bio three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't do that because the dot is much less typing. Um, using data train, it used regression rather than classification, made 500 trees at each. It tried six variables at each split. I can explain that, what that is. And then um, it explains 77% of the variation, which you know, seems good, right? That's not a bad thing. So what happens with random forest, it, it fits um, something like a card, where it could have said, well, if precipitation is more than 100, we go this way, if less that way. But if the temperature is less than 20, we go here. And the probability is 0.2, else it's maybe 0.3. If you go here, but if some other variable x is more than five, maybe it's zero, but if it's here, maybe it's 0.9. This is, this is a, a card, a classification and regression tree. Very simple things to understand how they work. Uh, Leo Breiman uh, came up with that. The problem is that um, they don't predict very well. And so Random Forest, you, what, it made, what it did, it made 500 of these trees using um, Two tricks. One is that at every tree it makes, it only uses, and that's a parameter you can set, six of the variables out of the 19. So it, didn't, it ignored 13. And it uses um, bootstrapping. So sample, sampling out of the six variables and then, and they, and taking a, a sample with, um, with replacement of, of all, the, all the observations. And so that made 500 trees, and all these trees, you, you get a vote or are averaged in the total prediction. And it's one of these magical things where uh, none, of the, none of the trees is a good predictor, but together, uh, many weak predictors make a strong predictor. It's a bit like, you know, if, if, if democracy would work like that, it would be great, right? So we, have, we all have complete information, but if we all vote, and now we get the right government, um, apparently. It's, yeah, well, yeah, the, 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 the percent variance of planes explains is not always high. Sometimes it is, you know, there's cases where I think it is. But. Um, 
what I was going to say about it. Well, I can say much more about it tomorrow, but, but I'm really interested in these methods, and I'm, I'm certainly interested in talking more about it. But um, my time is, is quickly um, running out, so, um, and I haven't shown you any of the results yet, but I'm about done with this, and I have two more slides. Um, any questions so far? <laughs> yes? Oh, well, yeah, if you have abundance data, that, um, you, you can certainly use that. Actually, it's ni very much nicer. Uh, no, it'd be great, um, right? So run a zero-one response, which you could think, you know, it's a binary response that you could do classification on, then you truly have a, a continuous variable or a somewhat continuous variable, yeah. No, I don't think so. Um, uh, you might want to transform it or something like that, but... Um, the other thing I should point out, because it's, because it's um, one of the reasons why this works well with prediction is that these are, in fact, interactions but you don't have to specify them. You know, the model will find the interactions for you. But it has ways to avoid overfitting. All right, so I made a prediction um, plot PF. So, so what I did here, uh, I said, uh, I have the model, and I basically say, predict to this raster stack of climate var variables using the model M. So M was the random forest model. Um, and now I get a prediction somewhere. And there it is. So, so that, um, that's the future prediction. This is the current one. Uh, so this is this is now a map say, showing. Now if it's dark green, that is where the climate is very similar to the climates where we observe the species. So supposedly very uh, uh, good for it. And you could then start looking about. You know, there certainly are places where it hasn't been observed, and, and you could start wondering, well, well why is that? Or, um, and there's all, there, you know, there are thousands of papers about this method and using it in, in all kinds of different ways. A typical one is in climate change so you, uh, applications. If I, I just found the best threshold. I won't go into that now. Um, but if you just look at presence absence, um, so this is according to this method where the species should be present or at least where the climate is environment is, 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 should support the species to be there, whether it is there or not, could be for other reasons as well. Maybe there's a city. Um, current climate, and then I, I got this other, this future climate, the CMIP5 data climate, also with this get data function. Um, again, I can talk about that much more tomorrow. Um, we can look at the future climate. Well, there they go. Um, this is one of the reasons why I actually don't believe this method very much. It's very, it's, it's just too common that everything goes extinct. Doesn't really make sense, you know. That, that it gets warmer and everything gets, goes extinct. But then again, a the lemming is, is certainly a Norian species, and maybe and you know it can go up these mountains. And at some point, maybe it can't go further. So maybe it makes sense in this case. We can look at the difference. Uh, I think I did that somewhere. No, not here. So um, the last line I'll show you um, what I. Where is the current plus the future is two? So where, where you know where current is one is suitable now, future is suitable now, together two. That's a. So this would be the only place that's according to this model where they could currently be and the future be. So in principle, you could say, well, if, if this weren't endangered species, and apparently it's not because you know, throw me to see. Um, they, have, they have this very strange uh, dynamics, right? They have very explosion of population and they start migrating and but anyhow the the you know people have used it saying that well then these should probably be good places to 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 have a reserve for these animals because there's no point investing in a place to protect them now where they would be extinct uh by 2080 when was this 2070 2050 according to the hadley model with the 8.5 rcp so it's a, it's a very strong emission scenario but I don't really want to go into the, into the details of the science right now. Um, my point was that, that I really wanted to show you sort of um, some live demonstration to get a sort of a, a sense of, of um, yeah, how you, how, you, how you work with this. Um, and I hope that I've accomplished that. So um, I'm going to skip that. i got five minutes. I guess two things I could quickly go through. That's all I have, I think, or three slides or so. Um, for those of you who have used this, um, writing your, you know, it, it, it's certainly possible that you want to do things that I didn't think of or you cannot do by combining existing functions. It's pretty easy to write your own memory safe functions. So that was, as I said on the outset, an important design principle is that um, 
data don't maybe you maybe not be able to put all the data into a memory. And this is this is a very basic function how you deal with that. So basically you say well I have a function of X, a raster, in this case A is some parameter, an output file name. If 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 I don't have if file name is not provided, I just take a temporary file name. Um, I create an output raster, which is just a raster of X, is just the template of X. Start writing that, so now it's ready for writing. I determine the block size, how big the chunks of the data are that I can read at one, any one go. So if it's a very large file, so I may have many, many blocks, and then I loop over the blocks where I say, give me the values of the original data. Do my algorithm, which in this case is you know, stupidly simple, is I add A to the existing values, but this, this is where you would have your lines and lines of intelligent code that would do something spectacular. Um, compute something, write values to out for that same row that we read it for, keep going over all the blocks, I'm done writing, and that's it. So, so the, there's, this again shows sort of these basic functions like write start, block size, get values, write stop, that, that should make it very easy to, to develop your own um, functions. So the, the main bottleneck in, in the roster process in R with, with the roster package is speed. Um, so the amount of, also somebody mentioned this morning, you know, the amount of, 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 of data is growing at a much higher rate than I can program. Um, and so, it's, although it's not difficult to fix, it's just a lot of work. I mean, it basically means re-implementing everything in C rather than doing R and then calling that and things like that. So it's really a tr it's sort of a trivial problem uh, if you had a, a sufficient time. Um, but I'm trying to get that. It's just time is money, so I'm trying to get the money to hire somebody to do that. Um, so we'll talk about later this week about multi-core processing. And this is a true statement. When you, need to, when you think you need to use multi-core processing, you're wrong. It's a probabilistic uh, statement. So this is true more than, you know, the probability of this being true is higher than 0.5. But it, it's, it's very common for people to say, oh, I need sort of a computer cluster because things aren't going fast enough. R is really interesting in how little mistakes can slow things down. So there's always other, other ways to, to make things go quicker. Now, if you have a cluster computer, actually separate CPUs, you know, if you use what I call a swarm, where you just basically send different jobs to every single node, it's very trivial to, to do multi-core. In many other cases, I would also say, well, there are only, you know, if, if time is a, a limit, limiting factor, it's often that you're doing a lot of pre-processing, and then there are simple online tools as well. But also, you know, like good old tools, um, for which there also is a, uh, some packages that you can wrap around it. But if you wanted to use multi-core, for example, on, on, on your own PC, if you have um, um, you know, um, several, several CPUs, or um, which, which I'm calling them, uh, this, this is um, how you can do it with a raster package. So I, I um, create a stack and say I wanted to compute the maximum value across the stack for all the cells. So it's a very trivial problem again. So I have a stack of three layers, and max s will just give you the max for each cell across the layers. Uh, this is, this, these are two ways to do it with cluster computing. Um, I have this, this function in raster package begin, begin cluster. Um, you create a function like this, and then you say clusterer with object s apply this function, which is then calculated for x the maximum value. So that, that's, that's one simple approach. The second approach is um, to actually write a normal clustering function like par apply and put that into the calc function. So there's the calc function where you say, here's the uh, object S and apply something to all of, all of the cell values. That function itself could be um, um, clustered. And, and that's just, you know, and, and then there's, um, uh, Jonathan Greenberg has, has a function in his package, uh, spatial tools. And so there's different ways to do this. But again, I, I would be cautious with it. Um, uh, what I, what I, what I um, value most is my own time, and, and so you can spend a lot of time trying to optimize this, um, which then might not um, gain back. All right, so tomorrow I'm going to talk about this more of the this, speech this distribution modeling. Um, I have another uh, exercise on more analyzing point patterns, not so much in the sort of the, the uh, spat stat statistical way, but more using rosters to summarize points and then, and then sort of describe that. 
you can also work on improving your own scripts if you're a Rust user, and some people have talked with me about that. They'd like to show me some things or improve some things. I'm happy to do that. If there's other things that, that um, you'd like to do, and you know, I, I might be able to, I have all kinds of materials, so I could potentially um, produce other things tonight. So let me, let me know over the coffee break. Um, oh, and, and then, yeah, I think that's the last one. I just wanted to, um, so the R book by Roger and, and, and Edser and others um, has, has been uh, mentioned a lot, but I, I use this in teaching uh, um, concepts of spatial data analysis. I think it's really good. Um, and this book came out uh, just this year, I think. It's the best statistical, statistics book in the world um, that's out there. It's, 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 uh, you can download it from uh, uh, Hasty's website. Uh, it's, it's really, really excellent if you're interested in regression and these modern uh, machine learning methods. And I can talk about uh, it more tomorrow. Um, I think it's, it's really but it's about the best statistics book I've ever seen, which, um, truth be told, says a lot about how many statistics books I've seen. But, it, but, but the ones I've seen, I, there's very few I understand. And this is one book I can read from uh, cover to cover without uh, ever, ever really getting into trouble and still learning a lot. So excellent book. Um, if you're interested in regression and random force, that kind of thing. So it doesn't do any spatial things, but it has examples in R. This one doesn't. All right, that was, uh, that was my talk. Thank you very much for your long attention. And, and nobody fell asleep. The slides, I will certainly, the demo script I could, but it's also, the handout tomorrow shows that also. But I, if, I, I'll, I'll, I'll copy this. Okay, I'll, you have the history if you want it, sure. Yeah, okay. All right. but, but, there, but the handout tomorrow is, is that's the same thing, but then with text around it. So it's, it's a bit more formal, but, but you're free to have this as well. Yeah. That's actually what I showed in a way with the crop function. So that would be one way. You make an object from the file, um, and then and then you could say crop. You could say um, you could you could do it. Uh, uh, so if, if say A was the thing, you could even do it manually, where you say you know B is um, crop A draw extent. A, yeah, so A is, in this case, the thing we're looking at. That's a, it would be a huge stiff that I now visualize. Um, yeah, but the loading is, is, um, doesn't cost anything, because all it does, it just says, okay, I know, I point to it, I know where it is. Plotting it may take a little while, but not really. If you really want to be quick, you could say, um, you know, plot A, uh, max pix, souls is 1,000. Okay, it's very, you know, there we go, and then... Um, um, what do I do next? You know, click, click, and now I have B as my um, my subset. Now, formally, what you you would rather do is is you say uh, E is extent, um, you know, ninety to ninety two, uh, twenty three to twenty five, whatever your interest area of interest is, and you would say crop. You know, th um, that doesn't overlap probably, so it'll give an error, uh, but something like that. You know, so this, this is this. So, so I have some large TIFF. I find it my area of interest, and I crop out the data. Uh, sometimes you don't have to do that. There's other. There's also like in the predict function, you can also provide an extent where you can just basically have that large file, but you say only use the small subset. There's quite a few functions that have that option as well, which is nice because then you don't have to create additional files. And this keeps your No, all all it reads is the metadata, if you like, or the, the properties. It just it just reads how many columns and rows. And that's it. Yeah, otherwise, it wouldn't be memory safe because, it, as you say, it could be huge, and you could have thousands of huge files. Um, all it has is, is just okay. I know what it is. So if you request the value of a particular cell, I know if I can find it if it's within the extent, and if it is, I can compute from you know what cell it is, and that that only that cell will be read. 
Actually, it, it won't do it right away, no. But if, if it's small enough, what it will do on processing, it will actually read it, rather than the, in these chunks, as I was showing with these blocks. Um, you can force it. I mean, sometimes, you know, if, if you really want to optimize and they're small, you can force it to read onto memory, So because then the, if you do many computations, it will be quicker, because it doesn't have to get it from disk all the time. So there's, there's a lot of trade-offs, and there's a lot of ways to, to improve that, you know, raster options is, is a razor options. That's also pretty good. Um, shows a couple of these parameters where it says, like, you know, uh, the chunk size and the max memory, so how, how, how much um, data do you, can you have into memory and how big a chunk at the time do you want into memory. The bigger you make this, the faster it will go. These values are pretty conservative. Um, if, you ha if you have an expensive machine with a lot of RAM, you can really up this up and make it, make it go quicker. Um, yeah.